If you're new here and this is your first Sunday and you're like, I just wanted to see what this is about. And you're like, what did I just walk into? Pray. <laughs> well, let me tell you why we worship. We worship simply because of who God is. If he did nothing else for us ever, what he's done, who he is, every single thing that God signifies is enough. He is holy, he is righteous, he is lifted up, he is magnified, he's exalted, he is bigger, he's better, he's greater, his ways are better than our ways. Let me tell you, if you flip to the back of the book, he wins every single time. The Hebrew word for God is Yahweh. And in the consonants of, 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 of breathing that, Yahweh. In the inhale and the exhale of every breath you are taking, you literally signify, you're saying Yahweh. You're saying God's name. At the very foundation of what we were created to do, we were created to worship Him. This is our why. This is why we're here. This is why you're here today. And I'm so grateful to God that there's purpose on your life that you would be in this room. You could be anywhere else, but there's beauty about lifting up God's name together, church. Amen. This is what it's about. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply Longing just to bring, yeah, something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Just sing it to him, tell him. Come on. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. I'm so glad that. Search much deeper within, yeah. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about Him, church. Tell Him, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things God made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. Sing, I'm coming back. Yeah. I'm coming back to the heart of words. All about you. Where it's all about you. It's all about you, 
It's all about you, Jesus. Nobody else but you, Jesus. Nobody else but you, Jesus.
one more time. Say it out. All to get full to me. Gracias. You give life.
you, Jesus. Lord, as, as we prepare our hearts and it's, we gather together as a family, we want to listen to your word, Father. And we want to dwell during the week so this word can echo and confront us, Father. And may we have a heart to listen and obey your word, Father. In Jesus' name. Ten thirty. you know how to worship. Wow, let's thank the Lord for our worship team. God bless you guys. Well, you are going to need your Bible, so go ahead and take it out if you need one. There should be one in the seat back pocket there in front of you. We are finishing our series, 23 and Me, today with 1 John chapter 3 and Romans chapter 12. 1 John chapter 3, Romans chapter 12, after Father's Day, we will be starting the book of Acts. Looking forward to that as a church. Um, it is 28 chapters, you know how I teach. We could be there for the rest of my ministry career. <laughs> so I know a pastor that spent 45 years, his whole ministry career, and all he taught was the book of Romans. Can you imagine Prepare, because Acts is coming. All right. 1 John chapter 3, Romans chapter 12. Man, it is good. When I heard you singing, tears started flowing down my eyes. I'm just so excited about the way that you worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer to prepare our hearts. Our Father, we've been learning a lot about you. Not simply to learn, but to be. Because you're our father, you're our dad. And when we were born again, you gave us your nature. So I want to thank you for how you are using your word to transform our body. Would you be glorified? In Jesus' name, amen. First John chapter 3 we're going to begin in verse 10. 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Here's how you can tell the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. We talked about that last week. When you learn the right way of the Father, you start putting those into practice because you want to be like your Father. Everyone grows up and eventually looks like their parent. In the same way as we grow, we want to look more and more like the rightness of our Father. But this week, nor is he who does not love his brother. There are two strands that make up the physical DNA in our body that determines what we look like. In the same way, our Father has given us two spiritual DNA strands. The first, we learned last week, the practice of righteousness, putting His rightness into our life. The second, we're going to talk about it this week, love one another. Love one another. Now, before you doze off, because there's another message about love. Don't do it. I want to give you an exhortation from Scripture from the Holy Spirit on this particular topic, which you've heard so much about. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Take a look at the screen. But concerning brotherly love, you, Calvary South Bay, have no need that I should write to you. Let me tell you something about our church. You love people. You love this, let me tell you, this church is a loving church. You've got no need that I should tell you anything more. Take a look. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. You know you're to love one another. You know you're supposed to love other Christians. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in L.A., who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, listen to what the Spirit says, even though you know so much about loving one another, he says that you increase more and more. So he writes to church and he says, listen, I know you know this topic, but I want you to grow in this topic. Everyone knows we should love our fellow Christian, but the exhortation is that you know more and more 
And so my prayer church is even though we're a loving church, my prayer through the course of this message is that we become more loving, that our love quotient grows more as a whole church this morning. So let's take a look as we grow. 1 John chapter 3, now verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now the beginning he's speaking of is not all the way back to Deuteronomy where this is first mentioned. The beginning he's speaking of is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And in John chapter 13, we see Jesus give the new command. Take a look. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Now here's the newness. As I have loved you. Loving one another, well, that everyone knew that. All the Jews knew that you were supposed to love one another. But loving as Jesus loved that you also love one another. Take a look at the qualifier. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, the newness of the command is not that you love one another. The newness of the command is that you love the same way that Jesus loved. And his love was sacrificial. His love was practical. His love was unconditional. And this kind of love reveals that you're actually following Jesus. Do you realize the way that we can reach L.A. is L.A. looking at Calvary South Bay loving on one another? Because everybody wants to be a part of a community. Everybody wants to be accepted and embraced. And as they see us accepting and embracing and loving one another, not only will we reach L.A., but we tell the world that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus made the qualifier that if we love one another, it actually proves that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't love the world. It's just not our focus today. Our focus today is that we love one another. And before telling us what love is, and before telling us what the Father's love looks like, he begins telling us what the love is not. Look with me, if you would, 1 John chapter 3. Now we'll pick it up in verse 10, in 10, 12, I'm sorry. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother... And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. The only reason that Cain hated Abel is because Abel was right with God and Cain was not. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Let me tell you something about the world. The world's supposed to hate you because they're filled with hate. He says, don't be surprised when the world hates righteous people. Don't be surprised by that. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. In other words, Christians love. It just flows out of us because our Father is a loving God. Whoever hates his brother, verse 15, is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Do you know that haters go to the church? <laughs> not this church. Not this church. But do you know that haters were going to the church that John was writing to? That's why he had to say this. Do you know that there's haters in other churches? <laughs> Not in this church, I'm telling you. And hate is the exact opposite of love. But I need you to understand what this word hate is. It's the expression of active ill will in word or conduct. The expression of active ill will in word or conduct. And what John does is he uses an extreme example of Cain to get the point of cross of what hate is. Let me explain. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel were our first sons. And Cain, well, they went to worship God. Abel went to worship God. Cain brought a fruit basket. Abel brought a lamb. God accepted Abel's sacrifice because that's what God required. But Cain's sacrifice was not accepted by God, and Cain got mad at Abel because he was righteous. So one day, 
Cain got so jealous and so angry and so mad that God gave more attention to Abel. He said, hey, brother, why don't we go in the field and work together today? Well, when they went in the field, Cain took a rock, hit his brother over the head, and he died. Hatred. He got so jealous, he killed his brothers. So what John says is, don't be surprised when the world hates you because you're righteous. The world has hated righteous people all the way back to Cain. But Christians, even though they hate you, we should love one another. We've got God's DNA. There's so much hatred out in the world that we should be loving one another so that we can go out into the world that hates us because we know that one day, on Sunday, we get to come into the church where everybody loves us. And our love, our love for one another proves that we're like our Father. Our love for one another proves we got God's DNA when we were born again. You see, any seed of hatred, jealousy and anger are seeds of hatred, and hatred is actually murder. Jesus says it's murder in Matthew 5. And any seed of hatred, it's not just jealousy, it's slander. When you stab your brother in the back, it's gossip. It's, it's selfishness, it's wrath, it's dissensions or contentions. Do you know there are seven things that God hates and one thing that's listed is when brothers bring division amongst themselves? God hates it. And I gotta tell you something, you're my family and I'm your family and the person sitting next to you is your brother or your sister. We are a family, and the Bible calls us to love one another, not persecute one another. Do you remember when um, Paul was on his road to Damascus, and he was about to persecute the church? Do you remember this? And he's on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Do you realize when you slander and gossip and bring division against someone in the church, you're actually persecuting Jesus? <clears throat> now just imagine if Jesus came walking in the room, his whole halo thing and all, okay? Let's say Jesus comes walking in the room. How would you treat him? When <laughs> Great job. And the Spirit of God just used you to speak to the whole church. <laughs> if Jesus came walking in and he sat down next to you, would you go, stranger danger, I don't know this person sitting next to me. Or would you go, Jesus, I'm so glad that you're here. Let me tell you something. Do you remember when Peter messed up and he denied Jesus three times? And then Jesus was on his way to ascend to the Father, and he looked at Peter and he said, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you. And what did he say to him? Tend my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. The way we express love to Jesus is loving one another. And if we had to put a Jesus face on the person sitting next to you, how would you treat them now? You see, you have to understand that when we love a Christian, we're loving Jesus. And when we persecute a Christian, we're persecuting Jesus. So what John does now is he gives us what our Father's love looks like. And the first thing I want you to write it down, his love looks sacrificial. We're speaking about to one another. And his love looks sacrificial one to another. First John chapter 3, let's pick it up in verse 16. My little children, let us not, excuse me, by, where am I? Very good. Verse 16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Verse 16. And we also, circle this word, ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. By this we know love. Let me tell you what he's saying. 
Let me tell you what real love looks like. Real love looks like Jesus when he laid down his life. I'll never forget when we were in Liberia, we had thieves come and steal all of our relief supplies that we were going to give the displaced people. And one night they came to the church, they broke into the church, and they stole all of, all of our relief supplies, like rice and clothes and slippers and salt and all the stuff that we were going to give displaced people when we were living in Africa. And I made the announcement on that Sunday to the church. These people had nothing. They are living in the aftermath of war, and I made the announcement to the church, hey, we're postponing our trip to go and give people relief supplies because everything was stolen. After church, one lady, she took off her outer garment because they wrapped themselves with two or three different kinds of wraps. She took off her outer garment, and she goes, you can give this to the people. That Sunday, because of her act, we had people in the church to bring clothes and food and bags of rice and oil and beans from their nothing, and we ended up with more things from the people in the church than we bought at the market. That's sacrificial. But this whole lay down your life thing, oh, this wasn't the first time that the church had heard this. They'd heard this from Jesus. It's John chapter 15. You'll see it on the screen. This is my commandment. This is red letters. This is Jesus talking. This is my commandment that you love one another. Listen, church. This is my commandment that you love all the Christians at Calvary Chapel South Bay as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his Friends, we've got to show the, the people that we're in relationship the love of Christ amongst each other as Christians so that the world can see the kind of love that we're talking about. You see, Jesus set the example of what real love is all about. Laying down your life meant dying on the cross for Jesus. He sacrificed his life. That's what laying down your life means. It means sacrifice. That's not a great word, is it? Sacrifice. Don't even sound great. Sacrifice. This word sacrifice, it means to give up something valuable to you in order to help someone else. That's not natural, is it? Let me tell you what's natural. What's natural is that's my parking space. What's natural is that's my seat. What are you doing in it? What's natural, this is my time. Me, myself, and I is the chorus line of the natural. Amen? Do you know that we think of ourselves 85% of the day? What will I eat? What will I wear? Where will I go? How will I drive to work? What will I do today? What will I not do today? Do you know we think about what we will do for ourselves 85% of the day? Sacrifice is supernatural. Oh, are you about to cut me off for that parking space? You can have it. <laughs> are you sitting in my seat? That's okay. Oh, am I going to have to spend a little bit longer at church because Pastor Chet went long again? It's okay, Pastor Chet. <laughs> Let the whole church say, <laughs> I set you up for that one. Listen to what Paul says. It's Philippians chapter 2. Paul says it better than me. Let nothing, say that word. Nothing. I didn't hear everybody. Nothing. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. In other words, you deserve that parking space more than I do. You deserve my seat more than I do. Well, I've been sitting there for 35 years, Pastor Chet. That is my seat. This building hasn't even been here for 35 years. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. So I got a question for you. What's valuable to you? What are you willing to sacrifice? And I've come up with three things that are valuable to all of us. Listen carefully. Our time, our treasure, and our energy. 
So a good question. Do you give your time to people at the church? Or do you come in, sing your song, hear the word, and get out of here? Do you come to church for what you can get out of it, or do you come to church to what you can give? Do you give your time? Let me ask you another question. Do you offer some of your treasure to the church? Well, I work for it, it's mine, and I'm not giving you a dime. (laughs) I'm not asking for it. In fact, I don't need it. God requires it. Have you ever seen one of our youth so excited about going on the mission field and has it done anything in your heart where you're willing to give them $250, $300 and say, I'm going to support you out of my money to go share the gospel where I can't? Our treasure is a sacrifice. You know what else is sacrifice? Our energy. Do you expend your energy serving people at the church? Do you spend your energy? Or is VBS just a waste? I get so tired. Last year, I was so tired. I couldn't believe how tired it was. I couldn't even possibly think about doing it this year. Now, listen, we don't need any more volunteers. So I'm not even making you feel guilty. I'm just asking you a question. And listen, for those of us that are volunteering VBS, for those of you that are not, pray for us. Because it's going to drain us. Do you know what it's like running after 650 kids for five, six hours? Listen, it's going to drain our energy. It's a sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice your time, your treasure, and your energy for people at the church? Jesus sacrificed for his friends. And here's what the Bible says. He laid down his life, and you also ought. You know what that word means? That word means that it's your responsibility. You see, in this context, picking up your cross daily then, in this context, picking up your cross daily, laying down your life daily, means that you're purposing to sacrifice for someone in the church on a daily basis. Think about that for just a moment. Love, his love is sacrificial, but not only is it sacrificial, maybe you'll write it down, his love looks practical. His love looks practical. We're going to pick it up in verse 17. Look at verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? His love is practical. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This one bothers us. The practical love, it bothers us. Let me tell you why. Because none of us want anyone to take advantage of us. We don't want anyone to take advantage of us. It goes against our American grain because it doesn't feel good if we feel that someone is taking advantage of our love. But we're not called to love by our feelings. We're called to love by faith. And faith calls us to love practically, even if we're taken advantage of. I'm going to prove it to you. It's not me, Jesus. This is red letters. You could read it in the Bible. Red letters, Luke chapter 6, comes right out to you. Look, to him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. This is Jesus, not me. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. (laughs) To him who offers you one cheek, let him take advantage of you and slap the other one. Take a look. And from him who takes away your cloak, let him take advantage of you. And don't turn away from giving him your tunic also. Take a look at the next one. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Are you kidding me? That's my lawnmower. You've had it for two weeks. (laughs) Knock, knock, knock. I want my lawnmower back. Jesus says, don't ask for it back. That goes against the American way. If you borrow it, give it back with interest. It's what we do in America. You borrow and you pay back interest. Not according to Jesus. We're not supposed to go around telling people that we love them. We're supposed to go around as Christians showing Christians that we love them. And I fear that because we don't want to be taken advantage of, we have boiled down this idea of practical love as coming to church. I love you. 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 And then we'll see a single mom out in the parking lot with a flat tire and drive right by her. I love you. 
Jesus says, listen, no, 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 that's not the love we're talking about. This love is practical. The love we're talking about for Christians is that you see the single mom and you know you're going to have to sacrifice your time to do some practical action of love. Let me prove it to you. Romans chapter 12. Go there with me if you would. Romans chapter 12. I told you we wouldn't like this one. Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. I call this the Christian creed. I call this the love chapter. Romans chapter 12, this is the love one another chapter. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what's evil, cling to what is good. If you're taking note, let me tell you about practical love. Be authentic. Don't just walk around telling people, I love you, I love you, I love you, and not want to do anything for them. That's a hypocrite. So he says, listen, do make the right decision. Show your love. Because that's good. Cling to what is good. Don't just tell people you love them. Show them that you love them. And let me show you what he says about the kind of love we're supposed to show. Look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Let me give you the example of what he's talking about. You know when you have a newborn and they start to cry? What do you do as a new parent? First child, what do you do? You run to them. It's like the pacifier. First child, if it drops on the floor, you like boil it. And then you put it in the microwave for 10 minutes before you give it to your child. By the ninth child, like us, <laughs> we, we, it dropped on the, we went from like sucking in our own mouth and giving it to them to letting it drop and then just putting them in and say the germs are good for them. <laughs> but with, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> When you got nine, it's just survival, okay? You, you don't care about the past fire. Just put it in, you know, whatever. Listen, when you have a newborn, you're a, you're a first-time parent, and that child cries. You are fervent in spirit. You don't lack in diligence. You run to that child. Let me tell you the point he's trying to get across. Be a family. Be a family. Be affectionate with brotherly love. And don't wait to do it. Do it as immediately as you see it. If you see a single mom that's got a need, why don't you just reach out and touch someone today? Be a family because she's your sister. Now, if you are a single man, do not help her. You go to someone else. You bring someone else into that single mom because you've got a motive. You want to be her family, and we're not ready for that yet. And you can send me an email. God bless you. Because I'm your family. I'm your big brother, and I just told you something. Now, if you don't like it, God bless you. Now, look at the next one. Romans chapter 12. We're going to pick it up in verse 12 now. Romans chapter 12. We'll pick it up in verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Let me tell you what he's saying. If you want to love one another, be there for each other because everybody will have a bad day. Pray for them. Show up with a a dinner. Show up with a piece of pie. Do something for your Christian brother or sister that goes out of your way because life has a way to throw curveballs. So why not go out of your way for someone else? Then take a look what he says in verse 14. Listen, church, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Listen, write it down. Be selflessly understanding because everyone's got good days and everyone's got bad days. So when someone comes into church and they've had a bad week and they come in with a curse, I'm here to worship Jesus. Ah. If you respond and go, well, you've got a bad attitude, and I don't want you to sit next to me. I'm going over here. You just curse them. They're cursing you, but Jesus says, bless them. Understand, they may have had a bad day. And when they come to you and they want to rejoice, rejoice with them. When they're crying, cry with them. Listen, in the lobby, this is my life in the lobby we're pregnant, we're going to have a baby, praise the Lord, glory, Jesus, hallelujah. I turn, I just lost my mother. I'm so sorry, let me pray with you. Then I turn, I just graduated high school, I'm so excited. Then I turn, 
They kicked me out. I got expelled. I'm telling you, when I'm 70, I'm going to be schizophrenic. I go from <laughs> rejoicing to weeping in a heartbeat. But I love you. And I want to be understanding where you're at, even your emails. <laughs> I love you. Take a look at verse 16. He says this. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. In other words, don't think you're all that. But associate with the humble. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Don't think you're God's blessing to this church because you're not. <laughs> and I don't care what you look like. You may have Gucci on. Let me tell you something. Don't come to this church thinking that you are God's blessing to this church. Because you're not. He says, be humble. Be humble. The only one at church should, that should be highly exalted, his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. So when you come walking to church, I've been here 35 years. I'm the best thing that ever happened to this church. I can sing. I can serve. I've done VBS every single year. You don't know what you have in me. Actually, yes, I do. It's called pride, and God's going to bring you down. Don't think that you're better than the person sitting next to you. Because when God met Moses, do you know what he called himself? I am who I am. You know what he was telling Moses? Because you're not who you think you are. Amen? Amen. I love you. His love is practical. Let me tell you something else about his love. His love looks unconditional. Go back with me to 1 John. Go back with me to 1 John, this time chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, this is our third and last point. His love looks unconditional. Look at verse 7. 1 John chapter 4. John is continuing the theme of love. Look what he says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love comes from God. And everyone who loves is born of God, so you know that you're a Christian if you're a loving person. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Everyone who loves, they have a relationship with God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This word love is that famous Greek word that all of you know. It's the word agape. And what this word does, it attempts, it attempts to express the unconditional love of God. To me, single moms, to me, express more unconditional love and are the best illustration of it that I could think of. Sacrificing two jobs trying to give their children everything that they would have if they had two parents in the home. Purposing to be the mom, purposing to be the dad, purposing to provide, purposing to give everything that their child wants, sacrificing every bit of who they are. What a beautiful picture to me. But even that only attempts, like the word agape, to describe the unconditional love of God. You see, God's love for us was not dependent on our love shown back to him. It just wasn't. He loved us despite us and sent his son to die for our sins. It's John 3.16, you know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Did you read it? For God so loved the world. Can I remind you? that a lot of the world has not chosen him even though he gave his son for the world. Because God's love isn't dependent on your response. You see, here's why. He loves because love defines him. God is love, not how we respond to it. His love is unconditional. And the spirit of God is beckoning us to love the same way. We also ought to love one another. Now, gang, I know. This unconditional love is probably the greatest challenge. And let me tell you why. People are difficult. 
the person sitting next to you has the potential to hurt you. Unconditional love is difficult, but we're still tasked with the responsibility. Look at 1 John chapter 4. I'll pick it up now in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifest. In other words, this is how he showed us love, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. This is real love, he says. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he showed us unconditional love. It wasn't dependent on us. He didn't want anything from us. He just wanted to give his love. Beloved, if God so loved us, here it is, we also circle it, ought to love one another. Obligated. Our responsibility. If the DNA of God is in us, if we're born again, born of him, we want to love this way. Paul gives us a great word picture of what this kind of love looks like. And maybe if you would, insert your name into this definition. Search your name. See, see where you measure up. I'll do mine as the example. Okay, here we go. Chet, love, Chet suffers long and is kind. Got a little bit of work. Chet does not envy. Chet does not parade himself. Chet is not puffed up. You're putting your own word, name in there. Chet does not behave rudely. Chet does not seek his own. Chet is not provoked. Chet thinks no evil. Chet does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Chet bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Chet will never fail in this regard. How many of you failed? Me too. My hand's up. And we're looking at this going, if this is the word picture, how in the world, I mean, really? How am I going to accomplish this? How in the world am I going to show this kind of unconditionality to people that I know have the potential to hurt me? Paul opens our eyes to two spiritual truths in one verse to help us with this. Listen carefully. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Let this truth sink in your hearts. And the life which I now live in the flesh, so this human body, this life that Chet lives in in the flesh, called Chet, right? This life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith. I live by the word of God. So whatever the word tells me to do, I choose that by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The two truths that I want to, you to embrace with this unconditionality is this. You have to know the love of God, in order to express the love of God. You got to know the love of God to express it. Paul says it like this in Ephesians 3. He says this. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. In other words, you will never get to the end of it. His love is so great, you'll never know all of it. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now that word know is really important. Because there's an informational no, like I read a book and I have the knowledge. I have the information. I'm in medical school and I'm studying and I have the book knowledge. But there's another word called a no, which is this word, which is experiential. In other words, I go to school and I've got the book knowledge, but then when I become a doctor, I actually perform an operation. Now I've got experiential knowledge. This is experiential knowledge. You can't express the love of God unless you're in a deep love relationship with God. Let me give you an example. You can go to church, watch me, listen, and walk right out. Just like you can go to a movie and watch a couple fall in love. You've been informed that they're in love as you watched, you just observed. But until you're in your own love relationship, you will never know the feeling of love. And what Paul is trying to get across, 
the foundation of my love towards others stems from my loving relationship with God. I'm in an experiential, loving relationship with God. I'm not just learning about a church. I'm experiencing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But Paul also gives us a second truth. If we want to live in this unconditionality, and this one's a little bit harder, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Do you know what that means? The constant death of self. He laid down his life. He died to himself to show us love. But he also died to himself to show us how to love. Because we think of ourselves 85% of the day, switching over to think about someone else 85% of the day is a supernatural act that requires the death of self. That's why the cross is the manifestation of God's love. It takes a daily dying of self to love God's kind of way. Did you hear that? It takes a daily dying of self to love God's kind of way. Amen. Our Father, we come before you. And our hope is to prove that we're disciples because of our love one for another. So would you grant us the grace? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Calvary. We have a desire as a church to reach L.A., and you're doing it. I was in Home Depot yesterday, and this gal stopped me. And she said, Pastor Chet. I said, yes. She goes, just started coming to your church. Man, it's just great. And let me tell you why it's great. Because you love people. And your love for one another, people are watching you love one another and they're attracted to it. They want to be a part of it. And that's what's happening. And our desire is to reach LA. And do you realize we prove our discipleship? We prove we're following Jesus by the way we love one another. Not the way we love the world. The way we love one another proves we're following Jesus. Some of you are here today, and you've been invited by someone who cares about you. And like Jesus said earlier, you're like, whoa, what is going on here? Let me tell you, we love Jesus and we love you. It's true. And Jesus showed his love to you sacrificially. You see, if you don't know Jesus, you're a sinner. Ooh, Pastor Chet, that's a rough word. Yeah, it is. There was no way for you to get to heaven. And I'm not ashamed to say that because I want you to get to heaven. You see, you were a sinner. You have done things against God, period. You are hell bound. And the only way you can get to heaven is through Jesus. Let me explain why. Jesus knew there was no way for any of us to make it to heaven because we're sinners. He knew it. So he came to earth and he lived a sinless life. And then he paid the penalty of sin, death. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day and he conquered death and he's the only one that can give life. So let me say, tell you something. Muhammad didn't rise from the dead. He can't give you eternal life. Let me tell you, Buddha, he didn't rise from the dead. He gave information, but he didn't give an experience with God. The Hindu gods, they can't bring you to heaven because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can get to the heavenly father except through me. So if the enemy has lied to you and told you there are many ways to get to heaven, it's what the enemy does. He lies to keep you from heaven. 
Jesus says, I'm the only way because I loved you sacrificially. I gave my life. Practically, I went on the cross for your sake. And unconditionally, even though you have sinned against me, I still love you and I still died for you and I still want you to come to heaven. Now you have a choice. Now you may, you may have brought a friend today. This is where you look at your friend and go, this is why I brought you. I love you and you need Jesus. You're a sinner. Don't be afraid of the word sinner. I know 21st century world, we don't like sinner, we don't like repent, and we don't like hell. But God does, and he wants us to know the bad news so that we can accept the good news. There's a way for us to get to heaven. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and to come forward and to make your life right with God. Jesus called all of his disciples publicly. That's what he did. He called them all to come out publicly because you're going to have to go out and face the world. And here's what's going to happen. When you get up out of your seat and you come forward, the whole church is going to erupt in applause because the Bible says there's more joy in the presence of the angels than when one sinner repents. And so we're going to rejoice with God at what is happening in your life. So if you want to make your relationship right with God, to know that you can know that you can go to heaven today, I'm asking you to get up out of your seat when Gannon begins to sing and come forward and accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Gannon, would you lead us? Amen. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Hey, listen, if you're sitting in your seat and you feel like something is pulling you like this, his name's the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want you to leave here not in relationship with God. So why don't you just get up out of your seat and give your life to him. God bless you. Amen. Great decision. Amen. Great decision. God bless you, brother. We see you. We're going to wait for you. Great decision, man. God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. We see you. We're going to wait for you. The Lord bless you. Amen. 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 Great decision. Great decision. Hey, listen. If you're still sitting in your seat, and I just sense in my spirit someone's brought someone, you need to be bold enough to look at them and say, Look, you need Jesus. You know what Paul said? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. If that's you, we just want to see you saved. We want to know, for you to know that you know that you have eternal life. And I'm just going to give you a minute. And you know, because you feel like I'm talking, you feel like I've looked at you. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. Good decision, bro. Good decision. Amen. Hey, listen, guys. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. That's what people have been doing since Jesus walked on the earth. Like Andrew, he led his brother to Jesus and told him what to say. So I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. And let it be, though it's my words, just let it be your heart. And our church, because we believe in glorifying God together, we got your back. We're going to say it with you. So would you pray with me? Dear Jesus. I believe. I believe. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Please change my life. Please change my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen. We want to pray with you guys. You haven't joined our church. We don't even have a church membership. You've come into the family of God. 
Pastor Pat is right here. We would want to give you a Bible and a quick Bible study. Parking lot's going to be a nightmare anyway, so you want to just give it some time. Why don't you go with Pastor Pat Church? Would you applaud them as they go? Hey, church, here at Calvary Chapel South Bay, we memorize scripture. Our sailor verse, pause and think about sailor verse this week, is Romans 12, 9. It's the New Living Translation. Say it with me. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Our challenge to change this week. Love other Christians sacrificially, practically, and unconditionally by dying to yourself daily. That means tomorrow, today, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, find a Christian and love on them. Amen? God bless you guys. Let's worship the Lord. I'll see you on Thursday.